everyone. Welcome back to the last session of the day here at AMS Automotive Evolution. What a day it's been indeed. We've been hearing time and again about the fast pace of transformation in the automotive sector as OEMs rush to electrify, keep up with changing regulations, supply constraints, uh, and meet sustainability targets. Have we heard, we've heard about battery gigafactories uh, and new EV architectures, for example, for BMW, uh, which require huge capital investments um, in, in whether in R&D, tooling, facilities, and equipment. Uh, and while these investments and vertical integration are necessary for some OEMs, others are gonna be taking a different route and we'll be turning to new partnerships and methods to innovate and achieve those targets. The commercial vehicle market, for example, is, is, a, is a space where, where volume and scale for electrification uh, are much harder to achieve. Uh, and the, but the road to decarbonize is just as vital and important as the passion to vehicles. In this session, we're gonna be talking about those innovations, innovations that can support those aims, both with new product ideas and new manufacturing methods. Re Automotive is a startup focused on developing and manufacturing electric vehicle architectures that help to quickly and simply electrify commercial vehicles. And at the same time, the company is deploying a highly modular autom automated manufacturing concept uh, that brings a lot of innovation itself um, and, and is partnering with a lot of interesting tier ones and manufacturers across the world. Our keynote speaker today recently joined the company uh, and is leading all operations, manufacturing and expansion for RE. He has more than 20 years experience in manufacturing and supply chain and engineering, and recently held the role of new product manufacturing into uh, leading the new product and manufacturing group at Tesla. We're so pleased that he's able to join us. I'd like to welcome Josh Tech, Chief Operating Officer at RE Automotive. Josh, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Chris. It's, uh, it's an extreme pleasure to be here today uh, and talk about innovation. In particular, how we manufacture in a smart and innovative way to accelerate adoption of EVs. My pleasure. So, Josh, I'm going to put your slides up there. I'm going to hand it over to you. We'll come back for some Q&A at the end. Thank you, Chris. Okay, so for today, we want to focus on the commercial sector. All right, why is this? It's a backbone of our society, and this is the way we lead towards zero emissions. Um, there's a particular challenge, though, in commercial vehicles for the transition to EVs. All right, why is this important? You know, the commercial sector plays a huge role in driving to zero emissions. If you look here, uh, this is a, an alarming chart. You know, for every commercial vehicle, it's the equivalent of 48 passenger cars, right? Um, and then, of course, on top of that, the commercial sector, it's not slowing down at all, right? So COVID, of course, was a giant push on this. Um, the consumer demands for e-commerce are, are continue to grow every year, right? Um, COVID did start it, I think, made a push. But when you look at it now, it's become kind of the norm. Like people aren't going back to brick and mortar. We're continuously ordering off Amazon or other delivery sites. And of course, that 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 every time a delivery is made, it's a commercial vehicle making that delivery. Okay. And then, of course, the on-demand transport, shared mobility services that are rising and they need to be more fit, uh, cost efficient. You know, more people are using Uber, more people are using Lyft. Right. We also need to be able to drive that You know, delivery. Final mile delivery is going to be a big certain uh, next couple of years, right? These are all industries that are part of the commercial sector. All right. So why has things not been made as much as you say passenger cars, right? Um, it's unique, right? The, the nature of the brand is changing. You know, it's not just the type of car, but the fleet owner, the, the delivery service, or the passenger, sh the passenger shuttle that owns the brand, right? Uh, electric passenger cars are starting to become, you know, really commoditized where the commercial sector needs you know, more flexible solutions that can be quickly adapted to each specific use case and lower volumes to be effective. Everything has to be connected and the importance of data management is greater than ever before for fleet management. And again, it's just so much more than the vehicle. You know, commercial vehicles, unlike passenger cars, require an entire ecosystem to support and make it work. All right, when we look at the ecosystem for commercial EVs, right? It's complex. You know, fleets, you know, compromise of tens and hundreds of vehicles they all require an appropriate infrastructure, uh, charging points, large quantities of electricity, connection to data and you know, management of the fleet itself, and also to the grid. Um, they have unique and precise needs uh, to service the new technology uh, and also manage the data. You know, they have to connect to other vehicles, they have to connect to the cloud, and not to mention evolving technologies such as autonomous driving. Okay. So what does the ecosystem for commercial EVs look like? Right. 
Um, so we need innovation to create these mission-specific vehicles, you know, manufacturing them in a smart and sustainable way and enabling a, a complete ecosystem for electrification. So this is a clean slate approach. You know, just building EVs on top of traditional chassis takes a lot of time. You know, money and it doesn't provide the flexibility and efficiency needed to electrify the you know, commercial EVs quickly. You know, it would be too slow, right? So doing this, you know, this constraint of a one size fits all approach uh, doesn't work. There won't be time to scale, right? So all the others are going at it alone, vertical integration. We need disruptive technology and a manufacturing approach that enables a massive shift towards global commercial vehicle of electrification. So at RE, we completely are disrupting the automotive technology with a full X by wire system that allows for fully independent control of the vehicle without traditional mechanical connections on the chassis. The RE corner packs critical vehicle components into a compact module between the chassis and the wheel with drive, brake, and steer by wire technology. With just these four modules, you now have space for a fully flat platform, which allows for more space for cargo, passengers, and batteries. So each corner is capable of all wheel drive and all wheel steer. Each has its own ECU, and that's connected to the central brain of the vehicle. You know, the fully X by wire system makes vehicles completely autonomous, driving ready. You know, for an autonomous driving, you have to be by wire. Recorner technology makes that fast and easy. So how does this tech benefit commercial fleets? So rethinking the vehicle tech allows us um, more efficient in terms of space and the steering position, but it's also flexible for vehicle design to specific fleet needs, right? We can, we can take your vehicle and build the architecture around the need of, of that, of that, uh, of whatever that product or component that you're carrying. So Reese platform can be applied to all makes, types and applications of commercial electric vehicles. You know, it truly makes things flexible for electrification for the entire mobility industry. With mission specific vehicles that are purpose built for a particular application, fleets can maximize value by having right sized and right function vehicles and also get more out of them. So more uptime, uh, carry more to maximize revenue and um, data as a service. So this module approach allows for faster, more cost-effective development and new platforms. So common alien systems, components allow for more development synergies and overall efficiencies in cost and timing. So how are we supporting this? We have a new manufacturing and a go-to-market approach. To go to market quickly and accelerate electrification, we believe you have to collaborate with the best in, in the industry. So how are others doing it? Vertical integration takes time, obviously money and resources. This is passed on to the customers in terms of availability to electrify and lack of diverse solutions. Horizontal manufacturing approach, which we are implementing, we partner with cabin and body manufacturers, upfitters, OEMs, and along with a strategically sourced supply chain. Um, this is to complete vehicles in a, in, in a faster, more efficient time frame and allow us to focus on our technology and bring the other technologies that exist uh, as a complete ecosystem. So we will uh, we will assemble our and test our corners and platforms in a highly automated, low cap low capex uh, integration center globally. These these integration centers or ICs as we refer to them are always located near our customers and partners. So our our reintegration centers are designed so that existing or short built or short cycle buildings. You know, essentially greenfield or tilt up you know, facilities uh, allow expansions required, but well within the development cycle. All right. So 
This year, of course, we've announced that we'll be opening our Coventry facility. Uh, this is our launch factory. And then a facility in Austin, Texas is already, uh, the build is underway to be operational next year. All right. On top of that, we just announced a uh, partnership with Rockwell Automation for a cloud-based system for connectivity across all manufacturing sites. The flexible manufacturing cells are installed in our integration centers for all our re-corners and re-platforms. They can be used for multiple customers and across all reconfigurations. Uh, the cells can be added or subtracted based on volumes. They're able to handle volume adjustments. Um, the Coventry facility will serve as a blueprint for all our future integration centers. You know, we can uh, replicate things quickly. You know, we can take those learnings across all assembly cells and across all facilities globally. Um, this is essentially a franchisable model uh, that can move between our re uh, ICs as required based on total collective capex. Right? We can we can even flex cells between facilities based on volume. So we've been at this for more than 10 years, uh, creating an innovative technology to help achieve zero emission goals. We're so excited to bring this to market. So stay tuned for the market's first fully drive-by-wire electric van on the road this summer in the US. With that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank, thanks again, uh, Josh, for that for that insight. I think the, the, the product itself is fascinating. It has very interesting implications for ramping up electrification of commercial vehicles and Re's uh, manufacturing approach is of course very interesting. I wanted to start on this uh, idea of horizontal collaboration and, and, and to talk about why you think, well, it seems like quite a compelling approach to, to save time, save capital, um, and, and sort of quicken the pace to electrification. But it does seem that some manufacturers want to hold tight to the, this engineering and, and to this sort of vertical integration. Why do you think that is? Why do you think there might be some resistance um, from OEMs to do that? Oh, yeah, it's an excellent question. And maybe I can tie that to some of my Tesla experience. So um, if, if I look at the, you know, let's let's talk about where Tesla was and where Re is today. I mean, I think it's two different worlds, right? Tesla had an initial problem of, you know, one, they had to make an electric vehicle that was viable for all aspects. You know, in the, in the beginning, you know, electric vehicles had kind of a bad name. So first of all is, you know, the goal was to transition the world to sustainable transportation, right? So that was the first one is convincing people that there was an electric vehicle that could beat any ice vehicle on the market, you know, and, and across all aspects, it was, you know, safety, quality, performance, etc. And then also Tesla, you know, they had a brand and they had to prove themselves. So that's why a lot of things came out of Tesla that you, you don't think deals with electrical, like the, uh, the Model X seats, the, uh, the Falcon doors, things like that, right? So their entire mindset was they had to beat others to the punch. And to do that, you know, we had to control our own destiny, right? And a lot of things were, since they were so cutting edge, the uh, the supply base wasn't there to even do it, you know, battery development and things like that. Um, now, you know, like I said, Tesla had to lead the development in many of those things. Now today, um, especially in commercial, you know, our secret sauce, let's call it, is the re-corner, right? Which drives our compelling business case. You put everything in the corners, allows for, you know, a larger volumetric footprint or usable space within the same overall volumetric footprint, right? So what we're doing, we focus our energy there while using, um, you know, basically partners that, you know, like for now, nowadays, batteries are more commoditized, right? So we don't need to put our resources into batteries. We should be focusing on the re-corner and how we, how we bring our business and what our compelling business model is, how we adapt that to the vehicles, right? So for us, it's, it's better to, you know, things that are already out there commoditized using existing capacity and use that to drive efficiencies through the value chain. Yes, yeah, so of course, you, you, you raised Tesla there where you have experience, but also we, we know that, that Tesla took a very vertical integrated approach for exactly the reasons you mentioned. Um, do, do you think this, this clearly gives commercial vehicle 
uh, manufacturers um, an opportunity to focus their value add elsewhere as opposed to, you know, this, this massive capital investment and engineering. Exactly. Right. So, so as, as I, I alluded to, right, instead of spending a lot on capital, right, we can use existing capacity that's in the market due to one, we're building many different types of vehicles. So they require many different times of investment in lines, right? Not, it's not a one size fits all approach, right? So that's another advantage is we can adapt to many different vehicle types and look at the, you know, the capacity to, comp uh, to create those components that's existing and bring that in. So it allows us to be much more flexible as well and allows a lot of concurrent engineering, right? We're not duplicating resources by having, you know, engineers are sites that are doing work that can be done by someone else or has already been done by someone else. Um, and we're utilizing that to, to drive uh, you know, efficiencies again through the value chain. So, so, so clearly, clearly the focus as we're talking here on commercial vehicles, does this architecture ultimately have applications beyond commercial vehicles into the bash into vehicle space, for example? I mean, we feel the recorner is completely flexible, right? The, the advantage today is it, it brings that flexibility in particular, if you look now, like cars are almost becoming a commodity, right? But to transition the rest of the mobility sector to electrification, we needed something more flexible is where the recorner technology really comes into play. Could it be used on a vehicle? Of course it could be, but we're, we're looking at where is the market now and where are the market needs? And we're focusing on, on that, especially like I said, part of the recorner is, you know, we get everything out in the corners. We don't have to worry about, you know, the, the chassis itself almost becomes irrelevant. Uh, and we can, you know, we can attach the corners to many different shapes, sizes, and use that existing space for more business oriented things like uh, allowing, you know, except if you're, if you're putting more people in it, you can put more packages, you know, all these mission specific uses that allows more optimization in the same overall footprint of the vehicle. Yeah, absolutely. I, I want to talk a little bit more about your manufacturing strategy and the, the, the integration centers that, that you spoke about, talked about the one coming online in Coventry next year in Austin. You showed us a great video that gave us a sense of things, but what do they look like from a manufacturing point of view? I mean, what's the sort of size, workstation, cells? I mean, can you give us a sort of kind of sense of, of, of what, we, what we're looking at here? Yeah, the, the beauty of our concept is they, they look completely different depending on where they are. So, so if you think about it, we can build a different size center based on the application, right? Um, how many customers are in there? What's the geographic reach? And the other beauty is because the, you know, we're not doing a lot of heavy manufacturing in those centers, we're doing more of the uh, assembly application, the building itself becomes very low invest. And we can also, it can also be greenfield or brownfield. We even can adapt if it exists, obviously, we can use a facility that may already be in place to accelerate um, the uh, the bring on of the on the facility, right? Um, you know, the idea is we minimize human capital. They're very flexible. Um, you know, we can optimize supply chain because they're flexible. We can put the building in, in an optimal area, right? Um, the other thing is 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 the flexibility, right? Let's say we have a customer in one in, in one integration center, and they, maybe we have a product that's ramping down. Then in another facility somewhere else in the globe, we're ramping up. We can then take those cells because they're identical across the world and even transition them and move them between centers to allow shared resources and move them, right? Um, it's really great for any type of cyclical volume, seasonal volume, um, and then even other tangibles. Training, you know, we can have centralized training. You know, we can deploy, you know, engineers into each facility and they're not looking at different equipment, right? Um, reporting, everything we bring from the line, from the MES systems, right, from the, the data from the line, it's centralized. We can now look at that as a, as a global amount of data and use that to improve the different facilities around the world. It, it's, a, it's a fascinating approach, one that, <clears throat> one that we see other manufacturers mirroring in some ways, but it sounds like you, you're, you're very close to cracking this. And you talk as well, I know there's AGVs that are going to be connecting the cells. Um, you know, are you looking at quite quite um, fast cycle times, I mean, a high efficiency, um, you know, how does that sort of compare com when we look at in comparison to more traditional manufacturing? In terms of the AGVs? Yeah, like in terms of the efficiencies that they might bring in terms of labor, yeah. cycle times, et cetera. Yeah, by, by having a, a, let's say, you know, we, we look at everything from an optimized, you know, material flow in a facility is, is where a lot of people fall short on planning any industrialized operation, right? And it's, uh, you, you can make or break yourself in a lot, uh, and how you plan your material um, layout of a facility. So we always like to adapt like a, a plan for every part approach. We say, you know, we know where each part is, what quantities, how many are being received, 
where they're going to go, at what cycle they need brought to the line, right? So then what the AGVs do, they allow us to remove any of that redundant or excess indirect labor. Um, and we can actually use that labor for more value added activities, right? So instead of having someone pushing a forklift around, we can actually use them to assemble parts or, well, you know, those types of things that are actually more value add to the product. So the, the AGV strategy for us is extremely important um, due to that, uh, you know, that standardized material flow that we're looking to implement and, and drive the cost down again throughout the, uh, throughout the value chain. And, and of course, we're talking there about the, the role that the AGVs play. Um, are you, are you, in that video, we saw a number of different types of, of robots and, and equipment there. Um, are you using other kinds of uh, flexible automation uh, equipment to, to allow you to be this modular and flexible? Yep. Well, of course, uh, let's say the more all-encompassing concept is the cells themselves, right? In both the assembly of the re-corner and the re-platform, the cell is, is flexible, right? No. Um, so that unto itself is our kind of driving force. But if you look at the uh, the robot, the end of arm tooling, we try to integrate as many uh, grippers or or tools into those. And then of course we have a quick change quick change strategy as well. Um, and that way, we, you know, we reduce we reduce cycle time by allowing the robot to be you know more multifaceted, right? The AGVs, of course, are still an integral part of that system because they are bringing in the parts in the right order, and we time that with the robot movements, right? And look at what's the most optimal assembly window. So. So yeah, I, I could see how that uh, the equipment comes together on that. You spoke as well about the the cloud um, integrated cloud project with Rockwell. Um, it, it makes me sort of think that this sort of approach that you're describing does uh, depend on high levels of connectivity. Uh, I would imagine in, in in production to to work through those cells. Is that um, is, is is that Rockwell project going to play a key role in that? Yes, uh, and I, this week, of course, we announced our strategic supplier uh, partnership with Rockwell. You know, they're a, they're a key player in the industry, extr extremely proven technology. Um, and yeah, having these connected devices is is a key part of the uh, philosophy, right? Um, number one, having the wireless connectivity. It's again standardized across all the cells. Um, we reduce invest in the facility, right? Because we're not looking at a lot of hard wires, things like that. But it's really key to the amount of data we can collect. You know, obviously we need to have traceability across parts and components and that way we can collect data from them while they're in use in the field, but also in terms of the process itself. As we're collecting cycle data and downtime, uptime, we can then use that um, and the amount, the amount of data overlay, you know, between not just one facility, but all the facilities that can be you know, overlaid over each other, we can then use that to drive efficiencies, um, process, process improvements, cycle time increases, uh, we can look at failures that are redundant um, and understand what's causing them to eliminate them. And the more data we collect, obviously, the, the larger the sample set is, and we can really use it to drive that. And then, of course, since everything is standardized, as we resolve one issue, we can then immediately deploy that to the ICs around the country and around the world. So uh, obviously data, the backbone in many ways of, of, of this approach. Um, <clears throat> coming back to the point about horizontal uh, collaboration. Now, that's obviously the approach you're taking with your customers. Um, is it approach in a way that you're also taking in your own operations and manufacturing, um, whether with kind of particular automation experts uh, to, to co-create and, if you like, co-design this this approach to, to manufacturing? Yeah, that is also correct. I mean, we are, you know, we have an extremely capable advanced manufacturing engineering team, um, but we rely on partners as well to, uh, that, you uh, also have experience in the area and we can we can bounce ideas off each other and come up with the best solution. So again, it's it's always important not to reinvent the wheel. You know, we want to we want to reinvent the wheel as a company ourselves, of course, but uh, that's where we want to focus the the our our brain power at. So we, we do focus with highly capable automation partners that are bringing their you know years of knowledge um, and support into creating these cells as, as we drive forward. Well, clearly, clearly those those partnerships um... In, in, in manufacturing and in, and in development and software and data will will play a key role for for Reed's uh, approach, which is just encouraging to hear. Um, and and it's, a, it's a, such a fascinating approach where we're really excited that we had an opportunity to to talk in more detail, uh, both about this 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 technology, uh, the the partnerships that you're making with 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 OEMs around the world, and your manufacturing approach. Josh, I really want to thank you uh, for the time that you've you've given us and and this insight. Um, any any other questions that we we have from our audience, we, we'd be happy to share uh, with, with you and the team, and we could we could follow up and 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 connect more, and of course cover that across across AMS channels. But but thank you so much for all of this. 
Thanks, Chris. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Great. And, and thanks again to our, our audience for a great day. We're going we're gonna to wrap up this session, but we'll be coming right back to you, uh, coming right back to you for an overview of what's, of what's happened. Thanks again to Josh, and we'll see you real soon.